have your way, and then you would illuminate our minds and give us understanding. And Lord, I pray that every every time that we come together, that we would know deeper of your love and your grace and your mercy, and just the boundlessness of this fountain of joy that you are. And we've uh, we've had such a dark image of you. And I pray that you would we, you would restructure our, our image of you, and we would see you through Jesus instead of seeing you through the Old Testament, that we would see you now through Christ. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would be here this morning through Victoria's um, heart and her mouth, and, and Lord, also through mine, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, Rab is uh, sharing with me, he's reading a new book, Guys in Portland, Greg John Pastor, Seattle. Seattle. And there's, they have a church kind of uh, like our size, and, and uh, they've been doing it for like seven years. And uh, there are 30, 35 people. We don't know how big now, but when he wrote the book. And so they've just been kind of stirring along too. And he's had times of great discouragement. Like, is this even doing anything? And the Lord said, no, I just need you to be faithful. to keep doing what you're doing. And so what Brad was sharing with me, and it's interesting because he started to preach very similar to what we're saying. I mean, it's the same kind of stuff about God's grace and his mercy and not wrath and not judgment. And... And just God's love towards people. And so while you share with me, I just kind of have this picture. And for those of you who've ever been around building, when you build a, a deck or a house, um, it's not very pretty at the beginning because you dig holes for footings, right? And all you're doing is pouring concrete and it's dirty, messy work. But that becomes the foundation to lay this whole deck and, and or whole house. And, and what I'm starting to see is that even though those holes are small, they do all the work of the supporting structure. And I see God that he's, he's working here in this church. Uh, I met another guy um, when I was speaking at Tequila, and he said his pastor um, from the other end of the city, way northeast Calgary, is preaching all the same kind of stuff. I know through First Assembly, they planted a couple churches, and they're preaching the same kind of stuff. Brad Jerzak in, in, in BC, he's preaching the same kind of stuff. We, we know of another couple in BC, and I know another pastor in Portland. And so it's like in this western part of Canada, United States, I believe God's pouring all these footings. And none of these churches are big. I mean, they're all tiny little churches. But God's building this foundation because he's going to build a great structure on it. And that many people, there's, I really believe there's going to be this revival that happens in western Canada, the United States, that are all believing this way. And, and it's going to really change the, the map of how Christianity is going to influence the world. So, so we just have to be patient and keep going and dig deep into God's love. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Brad Jerzak posted again this morning on, a, on his Facebook. And he was quoting a, 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 a Francinian monk. What are they called? Franciscan monk. And uh, he was quoting him, and he, and he was describing God as this fountain of joy, as this fountain of love that is inexhaustible. And, and again, for me, I'm such a refreshing picture of God, because we often think of God as just sitting white, glowing on a throne, going, no, wrong, not happy, you know, disappointed. And we don't think of him as this fountain of joy and love and exuberance and color and light and passion, we, we often don't think of them that way. And so here's this monk describing God in, in such terms that I think is just incredibly beautiful, that we need to grab onto that kind of God and enjoy the ride. Just, just bask in that river and see where it takes us. Amen. Okay. You ready to start off? This, okay. this mic makes me feel nervous. Nervous? <laughs> I, I don't like it. I feel like I need to sing a solo or something. <laughs> talk a little bit about it, but I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to go. And then as I was kind of, Matt said to me this morning, as we were getting ready, you know, what are you speaking on? So I said, nothing, I'm just going to give the announcement. So he said, no, no, you have to speak. I said, I said yeah, I know, don't worry. So I, um, this was a scripture anyway that's been going through my mind in the last year, and it's the end of Psalm 27. And this is David, and he says, I would have despaired I would have 
despaired. So I looked up what the word despaired means. Because I thought I should probably do some study into this since I have to follow that. <laughs> And then the synonyms for despair are anguish, dashed hopes, dejection, desperation, despondency, discouragement, disheartenment, forlornness, gloom, melancholy, misery, ordeal, pain, sorrow, trial, tribulation, and wretchedness. So I wonder if anybody could relate to <laughs> And we are being trained and equipped for all of eternity. And 
And we just think this sucks right now, but we don't see what's happening in us. And oftentimes, if you've been through difficult things, you go through it thinking, and I was telling the girls, sometimes when we're, we're in trial, we, it's almost like nothing's happening. It's like the tumbleweeds are blowing through our life, and we just go, nothing's happening, nothing's changing, my circumstances aren't changing, I'm not changing, this is all just for nothing. And often it's not until we have come through the trial, and we're put in a situation that normally we would have responded in a certain way, and then we respond in a completely opposite way. We respond with grace, we respond with joy, we respond with compassion or peace, and we think, Okay, that was not there before I went through this trial. And we can see that God has worked something of eternal value in us through it. That what God is working in you has eternal value. It's not just for today, even though it makes our life here much easier. It's much easier when you go through your life being full of peace, being full of joy, trusting the Lord, um, forgiving people, not harboring bitterness, not, not constantly angry and frustrated. It makes our life easy here. But the things that we're gaining here, we will take into eternity with us. So when we are going through trials, when we are struggling, the thing that separates us is that we go, God, this is hard. This sucks. You know, I'm not saying that we encounter trials and we just go, praise Jesus, everything's falling apart. But that's kind of how we've been taught, right? We just thank the Lord, you just praise the Lord through all your trials. There are moments where I've said, Lord, I, I am really mad and I do some bad language telling him how bad it was. <laughs> but at the end of the day, when I when I get over my temper tantrums, this voice comes to me and says, but I'm working my things in you. I'm stripping you of your pride. I'm stripping you of your self-righteousness. I'm stripping you of fear, of worry, anxiety, depression. I'm stripping you of all of these things so that you can have an abundant life. But one thing the Lord's been saying to me recently is that I have to walk through. You know, we kind of see the trial, we get halfway into it, we go, oh God, and we kind of try to get out of it. <laughs> and one thing he's been saying, right, and one thing he's been saying to me is you've got to go through it. You've got to get up and walk through it every day. You've got to trust me every day. You've got to seek me every day. And I was, and so Aaron was bringing up this point um, on Tuesday that what we go through has eternal value and that we do take these things into heaven with us. And uh, one of the, and I, so the scripture came to me as she was, as uh, she was sharing this and I said, well, just to confirm what you're saying, I just want to read to you, um, this is Luke 10 and uh, this is the story of Mary and Martha and you know, uh, Mary is the one at Jesus' feet. Martha's running around doing all the things she's doing. She's busying herself. And uh, So I'll start at verse 39. It says, um, She had a sister called Mary who was, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? I'm sure we've all said that to the Lord. Lord, do you not care? Do you not see? I'm being abused here. I'm being taken advantage of. And he said, so then she, so then she tells Jesus what to do. She says, then tell her to help me. And how many times do we do that? Lord, do you not see what I'm going through? And this is what you need to do to fix it. This is what you need to do to make it right. And Jesus says to her, so Jesus goes straight to the issue, okay? Because, because Martha is busying herself, right? She, she's keeping busy here. And he says to her, Martha, Martha. And I know the Lord said to me that to me so many times. Victoria, Victoria. And I always said that to you. Trent, Trent, and Brenda, Brenda. Kelly, Kelly. Mary, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She has chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus. And if we would just do that, if we would sit at the feet of Jesus, and sometimes that might mean we say, God, I have a hard time believing that you're good. I have a hard time believing that I'm 
I'm going to see your goodness in the land of the living. Maybe I'll just get my reward in heaven. Maybe I'll just get my reward when I die. But he's saying, you would just come and sit at my feet. All these things that you're bothered about, all these things that you're worried about, all these burdens that you're carrying, all this heaviness, I would lift them. And the things that I'm going to impart to you will never be able to be taken away. They will go with us into eternity. And yes, we bless those around us with the fruits of our lives. We're supposed to bear fruit so that others can glean from our fruit. But we take those things into eternity with us. So don't be discouraged. What God is working in you is, has so much value. It's more precious than silver. It's more costly than gold. And there are times we feel like it costs so lot. And I know there are times when I've said, God, the cost is too high. I just want to have a normal life. I want to have a little house with a white picket fence. And I want to keep the world out. You know, but there, there's been times when I just said, I, I don't want this life. It's too hard. It costs too much. But through it all, he's, equip, he's equipping me. And he's training me. And he's encouraging us. But the cost is not too high. And what he's doing in us has eternal value. Yes, it has value here. But he's doing a beautiful thing in his bride. And I know we get discouraged. And I know we get weary. And I know that's why there is that scripture that says, do not be weary in well-doing. For at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. Because there are times when we get weary. And we have to think, we are, we're going to get weary. But this is why we need to sit at the feet of Jesus. This is why we come together. This is why we fellowship. This is why we get together on Tuesday nights as women. And oftentimes on Tuesday nights, there's a lot of crying. Because we feel weary, we feel discouraged, we feel downtrodden, we feel the weight of our, of our disappointments. But we come together to encourage one another as well. To go, I know you're discouraged right now, but keep going. God's working things in you. And when we come together as believers, I can see things that God has done in, in you and in you and in Nancy and, and Kelly and Aaron. And I can see what God's doing in your life, oftentimes when you can't see it. So that's why we have the body, so that when Erin is discouraged and she's saying, I'm not growing at all, I'm not changing at all, I can say, yes, you are. And this is what Patrick was talking about, about us being prophetic and having a prophetic voice. And, and, and being prophetic doesn't mean that you stand up here and say, thus saith the Lord. Being prophetic means that I can see into your life and I can encourage you in areas that you don't see your growth, you don't see your potential, you don't see what's happening, but I see it. I see what God's doing. And so it's my job, like Patrick sharing, that that gift of prophecy in the church is that we build one another up, that we encourage one another, that even on days when I'm struggling, that I reach past that and I go, but actually God's doing amazing things in your life. He's changing you. He's setting you free from your fear and your worry and anxiety. And he's bringing a new day. And don't get discouraged. Keep going. And that's why we have each other. That's why we meet. That's why we do this every week, even though there are weeks when we get discouraged and we think it's not growing and nobody's coming and people are leaving and should we be doing this? But at the end of the day, we go, well, where would we go? Where would we go for family? We, where would we go to be encouraged? Where would we go to encourage people? Where would we go to build people up and to love, to love people? And this is what has eternal value, these relationships. And when we come together and we worship the Lord together and we encourage one another and we say, keep going. I've been through it. Some of the most difficult periods of my life, I have my mother-in-law show up at my front doorstep and say, when we were first saved, we had no money either. We didn't know where our checks were coming from. But God was faithful, Victoria. He provided and he's taking care of you and he's changing you and he's bringing you from glory to glory. And don't give up. And she That's 
through time after time. And she said, the last time I got it, I had a prophet call me out of a crowd. And she said, finally, I'm going to get a word from the Lord that's different. And he said, and thus saith the Lord, do not be married. And she said, I watched the parking lot kicking rocks and kicking rocks and kicking rocks. Because she said, I was so frustrated with the Lord. And he just spoke to her and he said, Joyce, so just keep on keeping on. And then look what he's done in her life. But it's when we're faith, when we're, when we don't have the faith, he comes in with the faith. And I know when you've been through hard things, you can look back. When we had Ethan prematurely, we'd just been married and he was in the hospital. I always um, like and grace to almost like spiritual Novocaine. It's like we just walked through it, right? We walked through it with faith. God gave us the gift of faith to believe that he would be okay. God extended that grace to us so that we couldn't boast in our own strength. What Matt and I weren't strong. We'd just been married. We had this baby. We had no money. We had our car stolen. We didn't know how we were going to pay our bills. And left to our own devices, we wouldn't be standing here married today. But God came. He gave us that gift of faith. He gave us that gift of grace. And we walked through that very difficult time. When you look back, when we look back, we see what God is doing in us. We see what he was doing in our marriage and in our lives. And we see the faith that he was slowly starting to develop, to, to develop in us. Faith for healing. Faith for believing. And, and he started to change our mind about what we believed. About him. That's really when it started, hey? That God spoke to Matt that day and said, you need to believe that I'm good. And that's really when it started 15 years ago. God started speaking to Matt about believing that God was good. And so I just want to say to Matt, too, that you're just such a blessing to us. Mm -hmm. And your constant um, reassurance that God is good and that he loves us. And that his grace extends beyond all our mistakes and all our discouragement and all our despair. That message has to be preached. Whether there's 10,000 or 50, the people need to hear it. And I just want to thank you for being faithful week after week, for getting up. Even when there have been 12 or 8 of us, and continuing to remind us and encourage us that God's good, that He's faithful, that He loves us, and that His grace covers every area of our life. Mm -hmm.
Because we can leave and go, right, right. I gotta, I gotta try to think God's good, right? So it's like for any of you who saw the movie The Matrix, and they're inside of this fake computer world that's generated and their brains are connected into it. So you can bend all sorts of rules when you're in the matrix. And so Morpheus and Neo are on the roof of a skyscraper in. Morpheus says to Neo, you've got to let your mind go. You've got to let it go. You've got to start believing bigger things that you can change the world. And so Morpheus runs to the edge of the skyscraper and leaps off and goes right across the boulevard onto the next building. It's like an impossible jump. It's like, you know, 500 feet or something. And then he just lands on the next building. And so Neo is watching him going, what? How did you just do that? So he backs up and goes, okay, let go, release your mind. All right, all right, we're in. But I'll tell you where his faith broke down when he did this. Why? Because he thought, okay, I, I need to run at it. As if that makes it any better. Like if I was standing next to the Calvary Tower and somebody came up to me and said, okay, I want you to jump up there on the top. And I went, okay. <laughs> Isn't it ridiculous? Isn't it ridiculous the moment I take a step back because there's some process in the brain that goes, well, maybe. Maybe I could actually pull that off, you know? Or if I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start training in the gym every day. And then I'll come back and I'll meet you. And we'll start on the other side of the street. And then we'll try, right? No, it doesn't matter how much training I do. It's physically impossible for a human being to do that. So back in the movie, you know, Neil's backing up in hopes that he's going to take a run at it and leap. And he runs and leaps and falls to his would have been death, but just hits the pavement. He just couldn't make it. There's no chance of it happening. The problem is, is that most of Christian teaching is teaching us to back up and take a good run at it. Go train. Go work out. Read your Bible more. Do more. Try harder. Dig in. Commit to Christ. 100%. Rededicate your life. We're going to have a Just as I am, I go. You know, we play it. People rededicate, recommit, and get on fire. And I'm not on fire enough, so i got to get on more fire. And i got to get all amped up for Jesus. So I go to conference after conference. And we know people that are just conference hoppers. <laughs> it's like every Christian conference is just there. And wings and birds and eyes and feathers and whatever prophetic conference they can find to go to. And they just live from one prophetic word to the next prophetic word, believing in all these promises that never come true. And they're just trying to get pumped up for Jesus. They're getting their Jesus jam on, and it's just like, you know, I'm just going to go through life being pumped up for Jesus. And you see the mid-conference, you know, that, that time between the conferences, it's just like, what's God doing? Nothing. I'm despairing. Why? Well, because I'm, I'm just living for this pump up. I can do better. I can try harder. And so what happens is that... The message can't be, well, now you've got to believe that God is good, so just do it. Just so you kind of go, okay, okay, God's good, right? God's good. He's good. You're good. I believe you're good. Good. I'm projecting happy thoughts to you. <laughs> good. I'm, I'm visualizing, visualizing a good fountain, shooting goodness and rainbows. I see poems and unicorns and goodness. Right? Oh no, okay, that's too new age and that's a sin and so I've got to repent of that. I repent of my new age thoughts and maybe the pastor is crazy and I've got to come back in line. So not unicorns, but break. I think rainbows are good. I think it was in Genesis about a promise, but not too rainbow because that's what the gay movement's using. And I've got to stay in line with what God's doing. And we're just stressed out, right? And the problem is it is impossible to believe God's good. If in the next breath you believe that God poured his wrath out on Jesus on the cross. And it is impossible to believe that God is good if you believe that he is still counting your sin against you. And it is impossible to believe God is good if you still think he's coming back to blow up the world with fireballs. If he's sending dragons and beasts to destroy the world and you are holding to that and you are in fear for the future. You cannot believe that he is good purely. You see? And so when we try to hold to both those things, we become double-minded. 
When we believe that God's going to take people and torture them forever in hell, you can't believe that he is good. It logically doesn't fit in the brain. The human mind knows it. Was, telling, was I telling you guys the other week, I was speaking to that atheist, did I tell you? <laughs> speaking to an atheist, and I was telling him about our verse in Philippians, and we switched, right? This, I, we, I was looking at a cell phone, and he's working there at the counter, and I just start chatting with him, and he goes, oh, you're a pastor. I said, yeah, and he said, you know, we preach from the Greek. Oh, you know some Greek. I said, a little bit. And so we were talking about that, and I thought that was really neat. We're chatting about it, and... I said, like, you take this one verse, right? Now, the, now the guy is, like, not a Christian at all, I can tell. And so we start talking, and I said, you know, it doesn't say that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but that amid our fear and trembling, God's accomplishing salvation, because it's Him that is at work to will and to do. And he just looked at me as if he had heard the biggest epiphany in his life. I mean, his eyes got huge, and he's just like, well, that makes sense. He goes, actually... He goes, I'm an atheist, hey? I said, oh yeah. He goes, but that, that would change everything. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say to an atheist. An atheist says, I don't believe in God, but that scripture verse you just gave me, that would change everything. And so I said, well, actually, I don't meet too many atheists. I said, I meet a lot of people who've rejected the notion of a religious tyrant God who's angry and condemning sinners to, to eternal torture. I said, but I, I feel that they reject that. And in fact, by their rejection of that means that they have more faith than most Christians because they believe in a better version of God. They go, I don't care what everybody says. If there is a God, he can't be anything like the Christians say that he is. He must be a better version of that. Not full of violence and anger and hatred. It can't be that God. There must be a different God. And so I reject that notion of God altogether. And I said that to him. And he said, I said, so that would be agnostic. He goes, that, yeah, yeah. Th th I'm that then. <laughs> and he said, and then, and then I was leaving. He goes, well, he goes, um, keep up the good work. <laughs> write a book after that called How to Convert an Atheist in Less Than 30 Seconds. <laughs> because for the first time, his mind and his heart heard truth. He heard the real gospel of Jesus. That it was not based on his righteousness, and I said that to him, but a righteousness found in Jesus that only Jesus could accomplish and do. Because it's only Jesus that can leap from building to building. It's only Jesus that can clear skyscrapers and run faster than a locomotive and a speeding bullet. It's only Jesus who is the superman. It is only him that can accomplish all of these things. And I make no attempt to do so. I say I just put my hope in him. I just put my hope that he will rescue me and he will be my deliverer. And not that he's some benign character who just sits in that lofty place with all these superpowers, but he is one that is good and he is one that cares and he is one that is numbered the hairs on my head and he knows when I sigh and he knows when I'm discouraged so his spirit comes to build me up and to encourage me and he sends me a song and a person and a word and encouragement to always be on my side and you need to know this morning your God is on your side. I, I know I've been talking about prayer, and I, I didn't really pray all week. And I'm always trying to, but this week I was so busy. And every day I woke up feeling guilty, because I got going on my business and working on stuff, and just didn't have time, I felt, to pray. And I felt bad all day. Lord, yeah, I know, this afternoon I will. And then something would happen, well, tonight I will. And then people came over, and then my friend came from Bible school, and I was always... So this morning I got up, and I thought, you know what, I'm not praying. Because I'm not going to show up in your presence just because I have to preach this morning. And and then and, and just come and say, oh, will you anoint me now? Will you give me power now to go preach? And I said, I, I feel that's, that's pharisaical. I feel it's hypocritical. And I, I felt so bad and so guilty that I, I couldn't even pray this morning. I mean, I purposely intended not to because I thought I, I just feel too bad. 
And then Victoria's talking to me, and I said, yeah, that's good, you should talk to it. Minimize my lack of anointing this morning, because you will be anointed. Now, I know she hasn't been down in the basement praying, but I just go, well, God will be gracious, and should just be good anyways, right? But I can't believe it for me. And so here I stand up this morning, feeling the anointing of God, despite my failure, despite my inability to get up and pray, God met me anyway. And so it's a living example of how much he just loves people and wants to get his word out. That he goes, hey, prayers for you. I don't need you to pray to get anointed. I've already anointed you to preach this message. Your praying won't earn it for you. It won't get you more anointed. And whatever God's called you to do, your prayer will not make you more anointed to do it. It'll just make you more happy in the doing of it. He wants you to pray so you get free, that you get released, that you get your happy on. That's why God wants you to pray, not so that you are worthy enough to carry the anointing that he's already predetermined to give to you in your sinful condition and state. He doesn't go, well, you've now qualified, so here's a bit more anointing. No, you believe in his son, so you're fully qualified from the go. He uses us in our broken, wounded, messy state and uses us in spite of us. I was reading that journal from this pastor friend who gave it to me that he'd written this, this thing. And the, the opening of his journal starts off with, when you get close to God, the first thing you have to remember is daily repentance. I'm like, well, there's no point reading the rest of this. I can be so bogged down in daily repentance, I'm not going to have time to read the rest. Then the next is moral living. Part of the church constitution is to set up a, an authority over myself, other people that are supposed to investigate my life on an ongoing business to make sure I'm morally living good, that I'm spending my money wisely. How many want that over your life? Five people. Five people to check on me morally and investigating you. You got one. <laughs> Yes, I believe, you know, as a pastor and a leader, God calls us and we need to be set apart and there are qualifications for elders, I get that, but God's not looking at us with a microscope. You know, God's not looking at us with a microscope, he's looking at us with his beautiful portrait-taking camera. He's looking at us to take pictures because he's so in love with us, not with a microscope to find out what's wrong. God photoshops everything. <laughs> Someone goes, oh, they had tons of pimples. God goes, oh, Photoshop, all that. So people look, well, that person's gorgeous. The Lord goes, yeah, my handy work. That's what I do. I make people beautiful. And you meet that person, you're like, yeah. real life, it's harsh. In line with what she was saying, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John. Chapter 3, all that with this. Chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. I want to define abiding for you. And we typically heard that we, we abide in Jesus, you spend time with Jesus, this is abiding, Jesus' Spirit is in you, the Holy Spirit, this is partly abiding, but how, how do we actually abide? How do we, okay, so we can go and worship, and we can go and pray, but often these are alone kind of things. Right? You know? And if you, if you sing like uh, like Cody, then you want to sing alone, right? So <laughs> you, don't wanna, you don't want to sing in a group of people. So you, you, you know, Cody would say that. So, you know, you, you, so a lot of these things are alone. You read the Bible alone, you pray alone, you sing alone. And so we have normally said that these things are abiding with Christ because they are spending time with God, but I want to add another dimension to abiding with Christ that I never thought about before until Victoria and I were talking this morning and kind of hit me as revelation, and I think it trumps the other three. I think it's a bigger deal than you being alone doing those, those things. So let's read this. It says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Jesus is our example of God. He lays down his life for others. 
And he says, this is our example. We know love by this. This is what love is. That we, he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You guys are all first John, okay? Mm -hmm. But who, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God, here's the word, abide in him? Remember Jesus saying, you know, my words need to abide in you and you abide in me as I abide in the Father and the Father in me. So they were referencing this again. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We, know, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Don't you love that? So here even this week, and how many times do you go through that where your heart is condemning you? And the Bible says that God doesn't condemn your heart because he knows all things. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows you're discouraged. He knows you've had a bad week. He knows who's cut you down. He knows what kind of upbringing you've had. He knows what your parents were like. He knows all things. And he takes all those things in consideration. And so he's not upset with you. He also knows you live in a world that's been marred and hurt by sin. He knows you're living outside of Eden. He knows you're living outside of your parameters. And he's pretty impressed of how well you're doing. He's pretty amazed that you even show up on a Sunday to come and sing any kind of song. And you need to start thinking that way. God's happy when I just come and I just sing Cornerstone. My sure foundation, God goes, ah, those people, they believe in me. They look at all the crap they go through and they still come and they still worship me. Yet we've been taught that God's been saying, well, you missed the evening service. <laughs> We're in that foundations class, and you didn't give last week. And we think that God's keeping a tally, and yet He's just overjoyed when you show up. He doesn't keep a scorecard. And whatever our heart condemns us, God even stands in between our heart condemning us and our spirit, saying, No heart. No, you've been confused by this sinful world. There's actually no condemnation. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandment and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. So just in case you get confused, there's a bunch of commandments you have to fill. He clarifies it. This is His commandment. Because He knew that the nature of man would start going, Oh, I've got to keep all the laws of the Old Covenant. And what are all those commands? And, oh, I've got to keep the Sabbath and not have fun Sundays. Sundays is just like, I've got to lay on the floor and not move so I don't offend God. <laughs> it got too hot, I sweated. I must have offended God because that would be like work. I was people really paranoid about the Sabbath. Remember when I was a youth pastor at one church, we wanted to go and play laser tag with the kids on, on Sunday, and, the, and some of the parents absolutely lost their minds. They didn't even think I was a Christian because I suggested that we would shoot lasers at each other on the Sabbath. Because we would be running and working and sweating, and that would be a great sin before God. So actually, they had a board meeting to decide whether I was a Christian or not. Yeah, those are hard days in ministry. You want to defend yourself when that happens. I'm not a Christian! Let me tell you something! Tell me what I think about you. Okay. <laughs> this is his commandment. So it tells us that we believe. This is the only commandment to you Gentiles. This is his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ. And love one another. Just as he commanded. So it starts with commandment. It ends with the commandment. It starts here. This is my new commandment. It ends with the word commandment to tell you that these are the only ones. No one can add on additional commandments. That's why it starts with the word commandment and ends with the word commandment. So you know between those two bookends, the only thing is that you love God and that you love one another. And this is what it means to abide. When we come together as the body of Christ, like the moment this morning, we are abiding in Christ. You know why? Because we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. So if you want to abide in Christ, you need to be part of the body of Christ. 
It is why when you don't come to church and you get away from the studies of small groups that you're invested in, you start to feel like you become apart from Christ. You start to feel discouraged and lonely and hurting. Now, God's not mad, but the problem is you're not abiding, you see? And this is why we come together as a group. Not because it's just not to forsake the gathering of the righteous. Not just that reason. Not because it sounds better to sing in a group than singing alone. It's not because of that. It's not just because of the teaching, because you can get good teaching online. It's not because of just those things. The primary reason we come together is because we then are abiding in the body of Christ. Do you see that? Revelation for me this morning. We are all selves of the body of Jesus. And so when we come together, and I lay my hand on Trent this morning, that's why the Bible says you greet each other with a holy kiss. We will accept holy hugs. Yeah, give Trent a kiss. But the Bible wants that because it wants us to love one another. We're in a culture where we're terrified to touch one another. Get comfortable with greeting each other, not just with a handshake, but with an arm around the back or a hug to, uh, to get close. It's good for the cells to be close to one another, to love one another. That's what our world doesn't have. Everybody's paranoid to touch one another because it's misconstrued about everything, right? Everything's sexual harassment. It's the Christian side of it. It's the Christian side of it. You know? And you know what? God just wants us to love one another. He wants us because that's what the body of Christ is, because you will feel safe and secure. And that's why we come together. And what Victoria was saying was so true. Because when Erin comes and abides with the body of Christ, she comes and abides in Jesus by being at a women's Bible study, then when she says, I am struggling, I don't feel I'm growing, the other cells surround her and go, no crazy cell. <laughs> We've seen you grow. Your mighty And that's what we do, and the cell goes, oh, I'm, I'm not so bad. Or we get together, we see that the cells are being infected by a cancer, or a bacteria, or a virus, and then we all come around that cell to attack that virus. Whether it's false teaching or condemnation, we go, no, those condemning thoughts, they're a cancer, they're a virus, and we rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And so when you get with the body of Christ, then we're able to come around and go, no, you're believing lies. Well, I feel like a failure. I've let God down. I keep saying I'm going to change, and I don't change. And we go, no, we're here for you. Those are lies. You are changing. God does love you. And the cells rally to bring healing and wholeness. And when somebody gets cut and injured, and, and harsh words are spoken by parents or at work or by a friend, or somebody leaves the church and says ugly things, like has just recently happened to us, some of you have come around us and go, no, those are lies, those aren't true. This is what God's saying. This is what's happening in the church. And we go, okay. And the cells come to bring clotting again to that blood and to repatch it again. So then eventually a scar forms and we remember the wound happening, but it doesn't hurt anymore. That's why we need each other. Being part of the body of Christ is being part of the body of Christ. This is how we abide, one with another. Awesome. Amen.